uh, as a brief to the students earlier and also uh, to all the members uh, uh, the visitors present here the purpose of o olympiad program in general is to expose students to the challenges and excitement which lies ahead in a subject if you choose to pursue it and one part of it is giving them problems giving uh, experimental tasks which help you feel what it means to do it and the other facet is to connect students to some of the leading experts in the subject uh, so that you can also feel what kind of what lies ahead for example i mean till you have entered college what lies ahead is just the competitive exams and the parameter of success is getting a good uh, ranking in the exam but the the life starts there <laughs> that is not the end of life and uh, and there there lies much more ahead and there are lot many things to be done and in the keeping in the same spirit we have this component uh, a, a visit a guest lecture by an eminent personality uh, who can share who has led who has gone through the journey with the subject and can share with you what it means to do it at the leading edge of the area today in fact it's a great pleasure to have with us dr vivek pol shetiwar who is a faculty at tata institute of Facult uh, fundamental research our parent institute um, well <laughs> i want to share that when i first talked to him he said that i don't feel fit in this role because i am too young and usually guest lectures are supposed to be from people who are very senior who are on very eminent position but as i said uh, our criteria is not the age or a senior position but also you know the excitement which you can convey and dr pol shetiwar uh, has been uh, a very unique individual in many respects uh, a little bit i would like to tell briefly about his background he came from a educationally from a humble background he started his journey from amravati uh, he did his masters in Amra amravati university and then went on to do his uh, doctorate in organic chemistry from drd it's a defense research uh, establishment in gwalior after he did his uh, phd he decided to go for a postdoc abroad in france he stayed for a one year postdoc when he entered the area of material science he he just shared communicated to me that he deliberately made the choice because he wanted to see what what it means to do something else and after that he got a job in jubilant chemsys in noida he came back to india he worked there for one year as a research scientist and then he went to us epa us environmental protection and agency in usa he worked there again as a researcher for two years a quite a different field from a typical research area uh, then again he went back to france in lyon uh, the chemistry uh, institute in lyon he worked there as a for one year as a researcher then he got an appointment at uh, in saudi arabia in king, king abdullah university of science and technology where he worked uh, as a faculty member in nano catalysis nano materials for four years and since 2013 he has been with tifr as a faculty member and uh, i mean i think his journey itself shows you that there is no i mean even though when we say chemistry is just this there is so much breadth what one can do and still it's not the end and uh, you, you will feel while talking to him that it's just the starting of uh, a big journey of you know open ended exploration and still with this when you take this interdisciplinary approach there's lot more you can do uh, and he's going to talk uh, briefly about what nanotechnology can do towards climate change towards combating the concerns of climate change because climate change seems to be a very global phenomena and when you seek of nanotechnology we we see it as uh, things which are at a very small scale so small scale to large scale is there any relationship and he's going to connect that through chemistry so i invite dr pol shetiwar to <laughs> to uh, conduct the session Thank you very much. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm feeling a bit nervous. Uh, you said so many things. So I will try to explain what we do uh, in the lab. And before I explain the, the research that we do, I will try to tell you why we do that. What, is, what, are the, what are the issues that we are facing and how my research or the research in this field will help to, to resolve these uh, societal issues. I guess everybody heard about the global warming, climate change. But I generally feel that we have lots of uh, misunderstanding about the fundamentals of the, the climate change, why there is a global warming, why there is a change in the climate. So I will try to explain uh, uh, what is global warming, uh, what, what, why, why there is a global warming. Is it only the uh, CO2, uh, excess of CO2 in the environment that is causing the global warming or there is something else? And, and afterwards I will, I will explain whether the nanotechnology can help to, to tackle this uh, really serious issue of the climate change or the global warming. So there is lots of chemistry. When I say nanotechnology, it's, it's full of chemistry. Ideally, I should say it's a nanochemistry. So that chemistry is the is the is the fundamental to to prepare any materials, right? And when you make a nanomaterials, it's, it's it's more important. So so before I explain the uh, the the climate change, let me briefly explain what we do in the lab. So we make a nanomaterials and and explore them for different catalysis. So when I say a nanomaterials, everybody thinks it's the it's a very small materials, right? You have meter, centimeter and then nanometer. So very small materials. So they will have a, a different activity. I will explain what is that afterwards. But it is not only about the size that decides the property of these materials, but also about the shape and morphology of these materials. Whether I have one nanometer sphere or a rectangular thing or, or a triangle or, or some other, other morphology of the material, that plays very important role in their properties. I will explain that afterwards. But this is what we do in the lab. So rather than only focusing on decreasing the size of the particle, size of the material, we also try to change their shapes and morphology. And that helps us in, in, in developing a better material to tackle these, some of these issues. So this is one of the material that, that we have prepared in the lab. We call it dendritic fibrous nanosilica. Dendritic fibrous because they have a fibrous nature, some sort of a dendritic fibrous nature. It's a silica material, SiO2, uh, with a nano size. Size is from 50 nanometer to 1200 nanometer. And then we can tune the surface area. See, this is around, it has around 1200 meters per gram surface area. It's like one football ground in one gram of a material. So that way you can imagine the, these values, right? So it's really high surface area material. And it has excellent stability thermally, uh, hydrothermally, as well as mechanical stability. And uniqueness is, 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 the, is the fibrous nature. I will explain what, what are the advantage of these afterwards once I finish the, uh, the fundamentals of climate change. And another thing is easy to synthesize. So we, we we don't use any fancy techniques. We use a green chemistry principle to make these materials, right? So that so that if someone really wants to use it, they can upscale it, and and it will be more sustainable process. And we don't only make the materials. We try to then ask the question that why why I got that particular morphology, that particular shape. So we try to understand the formation mechanism of these materials. We start from the molecules, and you get the materials of different shapes and size. So we ask the question that why this mole particular molecule converted into particular materials with size and shape. So that is the question that we ask here. Then we take these materials. In this case, it is a silica, right? Silica is like everywhere it's in, in, on beaches, the sands. So it is a purified version of the sand. That is a silica SiO2. But SiO2 itself will not do most, mo, uh, any, any, uh, uh, any catalysis or any other application. So what we do, we take this material and we functionalize these with, with, uh, with different active sites. Active sites is like some organic molecule. Let us say I have to do acid catalyzed reaction, right? Then I make this surface acidic. I create some acidic groups on the surface. If I have to do a base catalyzed reaction, then I, I make this surface basic. So that's what we do. We can also make, uh, we can also put uh, or, or decorate these particles with metal nanoparticles or metal oxide nanoparticles, and that will help you to to design different different catalysts. In addition to that, we also make a photocatalyst. So difference in here between these uh, so-called thermal catalysis over the photocatalysis here is that you can use the solar light. To, to catalyze, you need a re, you, for a reaction to, to move from uh, say A to B, you need some energy, right? So one way of giving the energy is you heat, but the other way is you just, just provide the, uh, the solar energy which is, which is freely available, right? And that will make that process more sustainable. So we, we, we develop a photocatalyst uh, which, which, which harvests the, uh, the solar light, UV visible and other even IR lights and that helps in, in catalyzing different reactions. And uh, the last uh, component that we do is we use the same material functionalize these in such a way that they capture the CO2 and that reduces the CO2 in the environment and that will help in climate change. So I will, I will go in more details afterwards once I explain the, the, the climate change. 
Now in order to understand, so these are the, the material that we discovered in our lab is now used not only in catalysis, but it can be used in, in energy harvesting, energy storage, sensors, in drug delivery and CO2 mitigation. So once you make a one unique material that it has lots of application in various fields. So what is climate change? So in order to understand the climate change, we should ask two questions. So why there is a life on the planet earth, right? That's if you know that, then I think it will be easy to understand the, the, the the issue of the climate change. Other thing that we all say, jal hi jeevan hai. But this is true for drinking water. What about the sea water? Do we, will you see the same thing for the sea water? No, right? But I think that is also the same. I will try to explain how the sea water plays a very important role in keeping our climate uh, greenery on, on the earth, right? So, so why there is a life on the earth? Because of the because of the environment. Because of the so we have a, a, a the temperature. Uh, oxygen, the water that is required to for life to grow, right? So if you see the temperature in, in other planet and on Earth, you see there's huge difference, and that is only due to the the atmosphere around the planet. That that really decides. In addition to the distance uh, between the sun and the planet, the, the other thing that is more, more more important is the atmosphere. So atmosphere decides the the temperature uh, on the surface in the environment, right? And so what decides the temperature? So what, dis, what is the atmosphere that we should ask? So what happens? So someone, one, one can say about what is the uh, how the how does the once the energy or the solar light reaches to the to the to the planet Earth? What happens? So ideally, you have lots of energy coming from the sol, sol, sun, solar uh, solar energy, and, and say three, this is the uh, rough calculation: 340 watt per meter square. Out of that, 102 gets reflected, and the remaining one get absorbed by different gases. Right, the CO2, uh, water, methane. These are the gases which absorbs, and then the, that 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 heat energy get transferred to other molecules, and that's how we have that that unique warm temperature that is required for our life. So now, what will happen if we increase the concentration of these gases? So you will absorb more amount of solar energy, right? You will start heating, right? And that that is the cause of the. That's a very simple way of understanding this. Is the as soon as you increase the concentration of these gases, you absorb more and more solar energy, right? Which is supposed to go back, and you you disturb the balance, right? Now, and there are other things that we can. So these are the these are the gases we call it greenhouse gases: nitrous oxide, water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide. So there is always one confusion. We call it a greenhouse gases, and we try to correlate that with the greenhouse that we see uh, everywhere in, in in the city. But that's completely wrong. Those that greenhouse works very differently. Okay, before that, let me uh, let me say why these are the greenhouse gases. So, what are the greenhouse gases? Those gases which captures, not captures, which which harvests the uh, the infrared radiation, which which heats the environment, right? So, any any molecule which absorbs the infrared radiation can be considered as a as a uh, uh, the greenhouse gases. So, you can see the spectrum. So, carbon dioxide. Uh, this is the uh, the IR region, and you can see carbon dioxide captures. Most of the infrared radiation. Other gas also captures. The methane also captures uh, or harvests lots of infrared radiation. So, the, if you increase the concentration of these gases, what will happen? More and more infrared radiation will get harvested, will stay at on on planet Earth, and you will increase the increase the overall temperature of the of the environment. Whereas, when I say a greenhouse, the greenhouse that you see uh, in, in in gardens and other things, th there the 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 the, temp, uh, the the warm temperature is not due to the due to the harvesting of the infrared radiation by the gases. This is just due to the so you stop the those heat going out of the up, out of that room, right? That's how the greenhouse gas work. But in our case, it's 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 nothing about trapping the heat. It's about trapping the solar energy by the by these gases. But then the question one can ask that why we are calling it a greenhouse gases? We are calling it a greenhouse gases because these are the gases, the CO2, methane. These are the one which captures the solar energy, maintains the temperature, and that's why you have the greenery on the planet. So ideally, you need these gases to to have the life on the planet, Earth, right? But then, if you have too much of them, what will happen? You will start warming the warming the planet, and and that's actually that's actually the the crux of the the climate change. So why all gases are not greenhouse gases? Ideally, any gas which capture any molecule which can harvest or which can absorb the infrared radiation will can be considered as a greenhouse gases but then you need to worry about the the uh, the intensity of the infrared radiation that can be captured by different gases and that's why these are the important gases carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide these are the one which which uh, which absorbs more infrared radiation and and a real reason for the for the global warming 
okay. So, water also absorbs lots of infrared radiation and uh, so one can also say water as a greenhouse gas, but ideally it is not considered as a greenhouse gas because you are increasing the water vapors in the environment because of the global warming, because of the warming. So, water is not really playing the role to start the warming right, it is all other gases which is uh, capturing the or uh, harvesting the infrared radiation increasing the, the overall temperature and that is why then you, you evaporate more and more water and you produce more water vapor which then start absorbing more and more infrared radiation. They do uh, create a trouble, they do contribute in the global warming, but that is a, actually a secondary uh, reaction right. I hope you understand what I am saying. So, this is the typical uh, cartoon to explain the, the global warming. Yeah, so, we all are producing the CO 2 right, the industries, cars and the burning fuels and then you, you create these environment of the gas right, the, uh, the gas clouds and now the solar energy is coming, it is supposed to go out, but now more and more of that solar energy is getting uh, harvested right, getting, getting captured and that increases the, increases the, uh, the temperature. So, what we have to do now, there are two ways, one you reduce these gases but I do not think we can live without AC, without car and without burning the fuel until we find other way right. The other way is then you need to increase the number of trees in the on the planet that is also nowadays not possible right, we have a limited space. So, then how does the science can help? So, you think of creating artificial trees which you can plant everywhere, do not need lots of space, do not need water and which will capture uh, the CO2 something like this. Uh, so, this is a typical uh, life cycle right, you produce lots of CO2 and then the trees try to take care uh, the sea water try to take care of the CO2, it captures. In fact, most of the CO2 is, is taken care by the by the, the sea, that is what I said if there is no sea water, uh, you cannot really control the global warming. Now, we have less number of trees and more more and more industries and cars and other things that creates lots of CO2. So, what I what we need now is some sort of artificial trees which can do the same thing with, with, a, with a limited space. And when I say artificial trees that is a fancy word, but what it means you make a nano materials or you make a materials which will have ability to capture the CO2, which will have ability to capture the, uh, the solar light, harvest the solar light, which also should have the ability to capture the water and then some sort of a catalytic reaction where you split water H2O into hydrogen and oxygen and use that hydrogen to reduce the CO2 to methanol or some, some, some fuel right and then you, you burn uh, methanol, you have a CO2, you again capture right, it is very dream project lots of people are working on some sort of artificial photosynthesis that is the, that's the only way I see to solve the issue of the climate change. So, it is the chemistry and, and, and a nano chemistry which will play a, which, are, which is already playing a very important role in, in tackling the problem of the climate change. And I will, I will show you some of the example how we make these materials and how, whether they are capturing the CO2, whether they are whether they are splitting the water and can you really convert the CO2 into useful chemicals. Yeah, so, this is another cartoon uh, which shows the another animation which shows the, the increase in the CO2. So, this is the uh, you can see the concentration uh, the more red it will be more CO2 and the, the NASA monitors the CO2 concentration and now we, this is this is our country and you can see with time the CO2 concentration is increasing. So, this is a global problem rather than uh, one country's problem and this is very recent uh, report. So, we right now we have 410 ppm CO2 level which is first time in the human history right. So, you can see now we, we are somewhere here. Now, one can ask so, this is the data about the carbon dioxide uh, parts per million. Uh, and this is 0 means 1950 and then you have 15,000, 50,000 uh, years before, 100,000 years before this is the CO2 levels. Now, one can ask the question how do I know the CO2 levels uh, at that uh, 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 on those days right, it is really really early right. So, there is a way to, to uh, uh, quantify the CO2 concentration in those days. So, this is called some sort of a I score technology where you, you 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 drill the uh, drill the uh, uh, what is that? Uh, okay, I, I will come back to this. I, I lost the word. So there is a way to to quantify the the CO2 capture based on the uh, the ice core technology that I will explain. 
So, another thing that you will see here is there is always an uh, increase in the CO2 level. So, this is the 180 and with time it is around 300, it is always the uh, sudden increase in the CO2 level, it is not really a, a gradual increase, there is a sudden increase in the CO2 level. But for the first time you we cross the 300 level and now we are around uh, 410. So, earth climate has changed throughout the history, but now we really really cross the limit. So, you can see the the, uh, the increase in the, the overall temperature uh, during this year 1880 to uh, 2020, but there are those who do not believe in the global warming they said no, no, no this is not because of the CO2 or because of all these things that I am talking it is just because the position of the, the earth with the, with the sun is changing and somehow it is coming closer and you are, you are getting more and more cellular energy and that is why you have the warming. But then there is a data which shows the uh, the solar energy that, that is reached to, to the planet earth and it is nearly the same, it is nearly constant. Maybe there is some increase here, but now you can see it is nearly the same, but still there is an increase in the, in the temperature which clearly scientifically proves uh, that there is a global warming and that is due to those, those gases. Right. This is another animation to show the same thing. So, how the, how the temperature is increasing with, with years now you can see here some spatches. So, we are here and there is a sudden increase in, in, in uh, last 30, 40 years and you can see now almost everything is, is hot right and, and so this is a this is a data from the NASA. So, I think you guys will believe on that. So, what happens in addition to the global warming what, what else can happen? If you heat the sea, sea what will happen? it will rise right, uh, there will be melting of the ice. So, that will also increase the, the water level and now you can see the sea levels are increasing from 1998 to 2016. So, there are recent uh, scientific reports which says that rate now increase, uh, the, uh, so the sea level, uh, so rate of sea level increase is now really fast, fastest in 2000 years. So, the prediction is based on the scientific data that in by 2100 the sea will rise to 1 to 4 feet. So, think about what will happen to Mumbai if that is that is going to be true and I, I guess everyone is experiencing the, the heat and, and, and the crazy weather. So, it is really happening. So, in addition to that since now there is lots of CO2 in the environment sea try to balance that sea try to capture more and more CO2 and then the, 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 the pH of the sea changes the acidity of the sea increases and you know there is a life in inside inside the ocean and that also get disturbed when you have more and more CO2 right. So, I, I will skip this yeah. So, you can see the, the situation of these coral reefs when we have uh, more acidic. Uh, so, this is again the prediction so, right now the pH is 8.179 it was in 1751, now it is 8.069. Although you see a difference is really small, but at, at that huge level that is really a, a significant difference. And in, in such a scenario there will be no coral reefs, right? Everything, everything will get damaged because of the because of the change in the pH. So, obviously the water the ice is sinking and and you can see that is why the sea level is increasing. I will I will quickly go to that, uh, go to go through these things, right? So, in addition to the heat. Uh, because of the global warming you now you have you have unbalanced the total environment total cycle of the uh, the uh, 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 maintaining the temperature on uh, on the planet right the the, the incoming of the solar light uh, uh, some amount of that light is reflecting and some it getting captured that is a typical natural cycle but now we are capturing we are harvesting more and more light and that affects several other parameter one is the extreme events that we see now we see the flood i don't know whether that is due to the climate change or not, but we saw that in, in Chennai. Uh, this is another issue that you see all over India, uh, especially in, in Vidarbha region in Maharashtra. So, these are scientific reports which, which explains that in addition to the warming of the environment there are some several other issues that we are facing now. So, there is also fresh water stress because of this change in the, uh, the environment. Uh, we know this one, there was a fighting for the, for the water. You, so, that is happening right ideally it is happening. So, now the question is is it too late to really prevent the climate change or it is it is already the reaction is already started and you can, can you can you stop that can we really stop the climate change. So, there is already lots of CO2 in the environment even I make a material which 
will have some ability to capture the CO2. I personally do not think that you can really reduce that 4110 ppm to some 200 ppm or something like that. It's, it's, it looks very impossible as a scientist. The material we make capture the CO2 is like 5 millimole per gram. It's, it's, that is the best value that you have now and the amount of CO2 that is already there in the environment is really, really high. So, I really do not know whether we can really prevent the thing, but can we at least minimize? Yes, I think we, we can at least make attempts to minimize. So, if we can reduce the, the, uh, the production of the CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the environment, I think there is, there is a chance and other thing is we change our lifestyle. So, it is not only a scientific problem, I guess it is it's also a social problem. So, although, although I will, I will only talk about the, the science. So, what, what, I, uh, what we need to do to, to, to prevent or minimize the, the climate change is now what I, what I talk about it is the, uh, the development of artificial trees that is nothing but development of materials which will have the ability to capture the CO2, capture the water, capture the solar light. And now whether I make a, a material, then I need to have a control on these materials. So, I need to, I need to decide the properties of materials such a way that it will have, it can capture more and more CO2, it can capture more and more solar light. And there the use of nanotechnology can help, because by using the nanotechnology you can change the size of the particles, you can change the shape of those particles, particles of the material. I guess everybody understand when I say materials, right, any, any, anything is, is material, right silica, the stable, this everything is material. What you see is a bulk material. I cannot really control the, the properties uh, chemical as well as the physical properties of these materials. But when I go at a nano scale, you can change the properties of that material and that helps you to really uh, develop a better, better material for capturing and converting the CO2. So, what we can do scientifically is, is trying to develop a material which will, which will do the thing that plants are doing, some sort of artificial photosynthesis and as well as developing alternative energy source. If we stop burning the fuels, there is other way, right. If you can use solar energy directly to, to run most of our thing, then the problem of CO2 is resolved. So, the nanotechnology solutions to the climate change. So, before that I will explain what is nanotechnology. So, uh, uh, the, 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 the bookish definition is the, the particles which are the material with the particle size between 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer are called a nanomaterials, right. But then you should ask me the question, why only 100? Why not 101 be a nanomaterial? Is there, a, why there is such a magical thing after 101? So, this is very early definition, I personally do not believe right now. Uh, one cannot define the nanotechnology or nanomaterial based on the scale, because we have materials now which are say 1000 nanometer, still show uh, a very different properties than the bulk material. So, the best way to, to understand or define the nanomaterials or nanotechnology are, is like nanomaterials whose properties are dramatically different than the, than their bulk counterpart and that difference in the properties are due to the size. Something like that will define more uh, in a better way the, the nanotechnology, right. So, this is another way to understand uh, the scale. So, if you have to measure the length of the man, it is billions of uh, nanometers. So, it's, they are really, really small. Now, why, why the nano materials will have unusual properties? Because they are so small, right. In, in bulk, if you, if I see the bulk material, you have only one surface layer and almost all other things are inside, right. And, and you can only interact with the surface layer, not the other layers. Now, if I, inc and you can see one drop of water contains around one, one, 100,000 of bulk molecules per one surface molecule. So, the number of uh, molecules on the surface is are really less when you use the bulk material. Now, if somehow I increase the, the surface, I increase more number of molecules on the surface, then the, when I say a catalysis or capture is all about the surface activity. So, you, you, you have, so this is, let us say this is my material and I want to capture the CO2. So, if I increase the surface more and more, the surface will interact with, with CO2 more and more, right and you can capture more and more CO2. But how do I increase the surface? One way is to just just have a huge space, but then it is really impossible to really increase the surface. Other way is you, you have a very small amount of material, say 1 gram of a material what I, I showed you and it should have very high surface area, say 1000 meters per gram, which is around 1 football ground in 1 gram. So, if I take a 1 gram of a powder in my hand, it will have very high surface area and then it, it will capture lots of CO2 and that is possible using the, using the uh, nano, nanotechnology. So, this is other way uh, to explain that when you, when you change the size from 2 millimeter to 1 millimeter, you can see now you have started increasing the number of surface layer. And when you go to the nano layer, uh, nano, nano scale, 
you can see now you have two surface layers versus two bulk layers. So, 50 percent of that material is now accessible for, for other activities for CO2 capture or light harvesting. So, when you change the when you change the size they also change their properties. We all know gold is ideally golden, but when you change the power, particle size of these gold nanoparticles now you can see you can have a different colors of the gold. Effect of melting point, I think everyone understand the melting point, what is melting point? You you are trying to just separate these atoms little bit away right and that convert the solid into liquid. So, what will happen if you go to the to the nano scale? Melting point will decrease, what, can anyone think about why will the melting point decrease? Okay, will not go into the teaching mode, but see this this is here. So, if I have to separate this atom from the other atom I need more energy because it is coordinated with several different atoms around right. But if I have to move the surface atom I need a lower energy because it is now coordinated only with the three, three neighboring atoms right. Now, if I, if I reduce the size of the particle then I have more and more of these surface atom which has a less coordination and then I need a less energy to, to separate them that is the that is the lowering of the melting point. So, there are several other properties that changes when you when you go to the nano scale. Now, how do you build these things they, those are so small you cannot really see them then how do I build it. So, there are two ways to build it one is called uh, top down method. So, this is a bulk material and I want to convert this into a nano material. So, I will just keep cutting it until you reach the nano scale size and that is possible there are some instrument which allow you to really cut them into very small nano particles. But you can then imagine this will be really uncontrolled where you cannot really control the shape and other morphology of that material if you start from the bulk. And other way is the uh, bottom up approach you start with the atoms you start with the molecules and you force those molecules to react in such a way that you get particular material with, with specific size and the shape and that is what most of us uh, do in, 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 a, in the field of nano materials research that we start with uh, simple molecules uh, say I have to make a silica SiO2. So, I will start with some uh, silica precursor Si with say 4 ethoxy group the simple organic molecules and I will I will I will force these molecules to react and, and assemble in such a way that I get a particular particular material with, with specific size and shape. Then other thing is how do I see them? they are so small right you cannot really use the uh, the light which has uh, any any light because th these are really small than the wavelength of UV or a visible light. So, you cannot really use this typical optical microscope to see them then how do I see them? We to see anything you need some sort of a light source and then the detector in our case now light this visible light is the light source and your eyes are detector. But in this case what we do then we use the electron beam as your some sort of a light and there are some detectors which will which will detect the uh, the, the scattering or, or, or the diffraction of the electrons and that way you can then uh, image the uh, nano material. So, there are two ways to image the nano is the transmission electron microscopy and scattering uh, or scattering scanning electron microscopy. So, in transmission electron microscopy you take the material your light source is here which is the electron beam you just put that on your material and you just take the image here. So, you are transmitting. In, in, in scanning one you have the material here like uh, the, the electron beam is here, but now your detector is this side you try to see the surface properties of that material. I think that is enough for, for understanding uh, this part. So, there are uh, all other, there are several other materials which will also help you to understand the mechanical forces and mechanical strength of that material and, and several other parameters. Now, how do we really take on the challenges of the climate change which is energy and environment if I can if I can find out the way to, to develop a non conventional energy source like I split the water and produce the hydrogen and I can just use hydrogen as hydrogen gas to, to run your car or, or do something else or I can I can convert solar energy into electrical energy and then that will. So, I think everyone is using the solar panels and the other one is uh, if I can take care of the, uh, the environment in addition to the pollutant if I can take care of the CO2 uh, that will be great and the best way is if I can have these two combined like uh, like you have a material which will split the water which will capture the CO2 and then you react that hydrogen with CO2 convert that into methanol. So, that is what we, we do in the in the lab. So, I, I already explained when you go to the nano scale. So, nano catalyst is again a nano material which do some sort of a uh, which shows some sort of a catalytic uh, activity. I, I guess everyone knows the catalysis right A goes to B you need lots of energy to convert A into B. So, you add the catalyst you reduce the activation energy 
and that, that will make that process more sustainable. And when you have a nano catalyst, you have a nano scale size, small size, very high surface area, large number of dangling bonds on, on the surface which will have very high surface energy and whenever you have a, a particle with very high surface area and surface energy then your reactant will react more easily, more efficiently and you need a lower energy to really catalyze the reaction. In addition to that you control the size, shape and morphology. In general typical catalyst what you do, you make these fancy organic molecules, uh, put, put some metal and some ligand and then you play with the ligand and then try to change the selectivity and, and activity of that material. So what we do in, in the field of nano catalysis, we just changing the shape and morphology of these materials, you can, you can play with the catalytic activity. And there are other, other uh, parameters that can be tuned. So this I already showed you, so we, we make these materials and try to develop different catalysts. Okay, so this is the SEM image, I already explained you the, what is the TEM and SEM, if I want to see what, what, what is the material, what is the size, what is the, the surface, how the surface looks like. It looks like a solid spheres with holes inside, right? But if I go close, in, you know, then you can see these are not really holes, but these are these fibers, dendritic fibers, which is coming out and this is more like a, a fiber spheres rather than a sphere with holes. And the TEM gives you the, the 2D projection of the same material and you can see now these, these fibrous surface, which it looks like some solid core in, in the, at the center. Now we also ask the question in the lab that why, why I got such a, such a material, why not, why not a solid sphere or why not a hollow sphere or why not some, some other, why, why sphere, why not a rectangular box, something like that. So we ask that question and, and you, that, that's, this is a bit uh, maybe at the higher end, but I just want to give some feeling what we try to do in the lab. So in this particular case, we started with one simple molecule, you know, the SI with the 4 O ethoxy group. You guys understand organic chemistry, right? And then we try to, we, we make this particular material. So how, how we go with that? So if you just take these SI with the 4 ethoxy and, and ask them to hydrolyze and condense and form the silica, they will, they will do it randomly and that's where you get a bulk silica, the sand that you see uh, on the beaches. But what we, de what we do is we force them to, to meet and condense in a, in a, in a proper fashion. So what, and in order to do that, what we, what we do, we create some sort of a template, some sort of a artificial reaction environment where the molecules can only organize and condense in, in one specific way. So in order to create a template, we take these CTAB molecules, I guess you must have heard about this. So this is like a C16 long carbon chain, a non-polar carbon chain and then you have a, a quaternary nitrogen which is now a polar head. So whenever you have a molecule with such a polar head and a non-polar chain, they try to uh, self-assemble to minimize the, the repulsion and attraction between them. So it's, it's a micellar behavior of those, those molecules. So when you add these molecules in, in a particular solvent, it could be water or water uh, oil mixture, then they try to self-assemble to minimize their energy. And that's what we, we use, we use that, that particular property to create some sort of a micro emulsion uh, uh, here. Maybe I will show you the, uh, the animation which will be easy to understand. Okay, here. So this is your polar head and non-polar tail. These are the molecules that I, I took it and added into a solvent. In this case, the solvent is water, cyclohexane mixture, there's water and oil. And then they try to self-assemble. That's a natural phenomenon of these molecules. They're, they're self-assembling to minimize the, uh, minimize the energy. And we, uh, we, it, it's called a lamellar uh, phase or lamellar micelles. And then you add one more molecule, which is also polar, which is having a polar head and non-polar tail. And those molecules go in between these template molecules, these are called co-template or co-surfactant that stabilizes the entire system. And this is actually a part of a, uh, a bicontinuous microemulsion droplet. So you form some sort of a droplet using these simple uh, surfactant molecules. So these are the uh, microemulsion droplet, we call it the BMDs. So these are not the silica, these are my template, these are my pot where I am doing the reaction. Now when I add my precursor SI with 4 ethoxy, the precursor can only go into the cyclohexane phase, which you see these, these gaps in between, and they can only react and condense and form the silica only in those, those empty spaces. So now if I play with these empty spaces, I, will play, I, will, I, can, I can design the material based on that. And if I, if I change the thickness of these, these uh, levers, I will get a thin fibers of the silica. If I increase, I will get a thick fiber of the silica. So based on that, and in, adi in, 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 in addition to that, we also play with the size. Now if I I force these small microemulsion droplet to merge into bigger one, then I can get a bigger size nanoparticles. 
if I keep them away, I can get a smaller size particle. So, the, I just wanted to show how we do it in the lab, how we tune the size, shape and, and other properties of that material by simply using a, a typical organic chemistry, right. And then we try to use that for different applications, uh, catalysis, when, when we are using a nanomaterial, we call it a nano catalysis. So, this is one application, hydrogenolysis of alkanes. So, you know in, in, in an oil well, once you take out the petrol, there is lots of uh, long chain alkanes still, uh, still there right say C5, C6, C8 which is not really useful. So, why not to break them into smaller alkanes again right C ethane or, or propane or, or butane. So, it is it's not easy to really because it needs really lot, lot of energy to break these CC bond in those long chain alkanes. So, there we showed that if I use our uh, catalyst the so KCC1 is this silica material with very small dots that you see these are very small ruthenium nanoparticles, uh, nanoparticles of ruthenium metal with a 1 to 5 nanometer size and we showed that I skip that okay sorry and I, we showed that uh, this this works really well for for uh, hydrogenolysis it is like lysis it is a breaking of the bond using the hydrogen gas. So, you break these longer chain into a smaller chain okay. So, this is how we we develop the catalyst in the lab and we also showed why this particular material is better than the other conventional material that is available in the market. So, when I say a catalysis catalysis is about the the accessibility of your reactant in this case alkanes with the active site. Now, I said I we made a so the one way to increase the surface area I said how do I how do I make a material with a very high surface area let us say I have a sphere. So, sphere surface area is only the external surface solid sphere. Now, I want to increase the surface area of that sphere what what should I do without changing the size. One way is to change the size to smaller and smaller, but there is a limit. So, what what could be the other way of changing the what could be the other way of increasing the surface area what is it. No, but that is again in decreasing the size I do not want to decrease the size is fixed I still want to increase the surface area. No change in the shape it is the same it should be the same porous right you create a holes inside now I can ex I can use this surface area right. So, you have the same size, but you create a holes pores and that increases the size, but now it comes with comes up with some problem. So, if I have a pore let us say this this is my pore. So, I can enter only from this side and I can exit from only this side. So, something like this here. So, this is a porous material say uh, a sphere with I am only showing this surface and these are the pore. Now, I, I loaded and I, I just showed the open open pore. So, now you can see the reactant can only go from the top right. So, I can only use this active site these ruthenium sites for catalysis rest of the active sites which are there which are there in the pores will not be accessible. So, even after having high surface area that will not help if you are not able to use that surface if you are not able to access that surface area. So, that is the problem with all the conventional materials that that they are there and that is where our material is different. Now, because it is a fibrous material you can reach it from everywhere there is no pores now it is just taking out those pores out it is a fibrous material. So, now you can ideally reach obviously not 100 percent you still have some issue with the center particles, but ideally as compared to this one you have more accessibility of those active sites because of uh, non porous, but still high surface area property of that material and that helps in increasing the catalytic activity of, of that particular catalyst. So, by using the same uh, principle we prepared other catalysts. So, these these bright dots are now palladium nanoparticles and you can do this C C coupling reaction one of the well known reaction for in, in a drug industry. One can also uh, not only the metal nanoparticle one can also functionalize this silica with, with other active sites in this case tantalum hydride which also helps you to break these uh, are in this particular case metathesis you make the C C bond and break some C C bond. This is another way I, I said I have now silica, silica do not do anything by itself I need to make convert them into something. So, let us say I want to do a base catalyzed reaction. So, one way is to use the base NaOH and KOH that you want, but once you use that base it is gone right you cannot really recycle that, but think about a base which you can keep using it. one reaction another reaction third reaction recycling. So, that will make the process more sustainable. So, that can be done by converting by making a solid base. So, this is the silica when I say silica it is not SiO2, but it has some SiOH on the surface and now you can play with these SiOH and convert these SiOH into some basic uh, basic functionality. In this particular case we treated with ammonia gas and convert those SiOH into SiNH2 and now I have a solid base which do a base catalyzed reaction and I can keep using it for several cycles without any decrease in the activity. So, that will again make the process uh, more sustainable and that helps in the in the environment. Then other one is the photocatalysis how do I build the photocatalysis to to, to harvest the solar light or, or to, to split the water. So, here what we did we 
So, silica, it's, silica is an insulator, I guess, insulator semiconductor that you guys must have heard. So, it's insulator has a uh, very wide band gap. So, it, it, the, the energy that you get from the solar is not enough to excite these electrons from ground state to higher state that is required to this photocatalysis. So, we need a semiconducting material. So, what we did, we, we took this KCC wire and coated each of these fibers with, with well known, well known uh, semiconducting material called TiO2. And now, I got a very high surface area semiconducting TiO2. And again, the accessibility of the TiO2 will be better over the conventional material because this is more of fibrous material over the porous material. And, and this, is, this is a typical data to show that when we coated, this is the elemental mapping. So, wherever you see a silica, there is a TI indicates that the coating was, was uniform. And we showed that the, our catalyst is far better than the catalyst that is reported in the literature. So, you can see the rate of reaction, rate of degradation in this particular case of a dye. Now, what is the limit? Well, how do I increase the active cat catalytic activity? I said we go to from bulk to the nano, higher surface energy, higher surface area, you get a better activity. What else we can, so what, what could be the limit? I, what, what should be the lowest possible size uh, that will give me the highest catalytic activity? So, ideally it should be the atom then, right? You go to the atom, that should show ideally, yeah, that is not really a, a straight forward because some reaction need a two or three atoms nearby, then only that, that can get catalyzed. But let us say you, you are talking about a reaction which only need one, one atom to catalyze the reaction, then in that case it should be the atomic scale catalyst which should show highest catalytic activity. But then the problem is why will that single atom will be stable, right? It will never be stable, it will meet with someone and, and agglomerate or it, it will react with someone. So, the challenge is in, in, in a single atom catalyst is you, you stabilize those single atoms. So, what we try to do is we try to use this silica surface and you fix the single atom on this surface by some strong interaction of the silica SiO with, with these metal atoms. And once you, once you stabilize, then they will act as an excellent catalytic act, excellent catalyst. So, that is what we did. We, 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 you can see here, this is the TM image of the KCC one is again the silica. We prepare a gold single atoms and you can see these, these are, so this is a 2 nanometer scale and this is, these are the single atoms of the gold. So, now you can even see the atoms in using the transmission electron microscopy. And now I show you the difference. So, when I go to the single atom, this is the turn on number and these are the best known catalysts in the literature. This is our recent work where you see the huge difference in the catalytic activity. What is turn on number is like one mole of a gold can convert this many moles of reactant to product. So, that is really huge, it is half a million. So, one mole of a gold can convert half a million of a reactant into the product. And that is what you want. Now, you, you are using less catalyst, less energy and producing the same amount of the chemicals and that will help you to, to protect the climate. So, in, in, in chemistry, in, it is not only the converting A into B, you want A to be converted only into B not a C. You do not want any byproduct, right? You want to play with the selectivity of the reaction. So, in nanocatalysis, you can also play with the selectivity of the reaction by just changing the size of the particles. One particular size gives you one particular product, another one gives you another another product and that helps you in tuning the catalytic activity as well as the selectivity. We also showed that the same material, if you functionalize in such a way that will capture the CO2 uh, uh, works well. So, so, this is like you have lots of CO2 coming from the industry, you create some sort of a net to capture the CO2 and this net is nothing but your nanometer, this is a cartoonistic view of that. So, Okay, I skip. I, I did not show it. I, I showed it here. So what we did, we took this KCC one and functionalized these with lots of amines, and these amine, basic amine, try to react with the the little bit acidic CO2, and they capture the CO2. And we show that, and you can see the our materials as compared to the the uh, to the best known material MCM41. You can see there is a difference between the CO2 capture capacity in millimoles per gram. But obviously these are very small numbers as compared to the CO2 that we have in the environment. So, we are far, far behind uh, what is really needed. And then once you have the material, you, then you can have those, this is a cartoon where you can have these trees, artificial trees which is coated with these nanomaterials and then they will capture, uh, continuously keep capturing the CO2 and, and reduce, the, reduce the, uh, the CO2 in the environment. So, these are some of these uh, that really happen in, in, in reality. And it is not only the capture, but what will you do once you capture the CO2? You keep it somewhere, but the, if it is leaks or something happens, then it is the same problem. So, the best way is to capture that CO2 and convert it into useful chemicals. But you know CO2 is a linear molecule, very stable. Why will CO2 will react with anything and convert into 
any other organic molecule. So, that is another challenge in the field of catalysis. So, what we do we, we, we adsorb these CO2 on the surface and once the CO2 get adsorbed on the surface they bends a little bit and that then you that then that, that makes them more reactive and that that helps you to convert the CO2 into some useful chemical. So, you need a now a catalyst which will allow the CO2 to bend as well as you need some catalytic active site which will allow you to convert the CO2 to some other useful chemicals. So, the so that is already known that there are several other ways of converting the CO2 into useful chemicals, but the, the challenge here is all of these are carried out at very high pressure 100 bars or something like that, but that is again uh, energy demanding system. So, you need a system which will which will capture and convert the CO2 at atmospheric pressure which is still a challenge. And this another thing artificial leaf which will capture the CO2 harvest the solar light and then convert that CO2 to methanol that is what I am saying everyone is uh, trying to get into there, but it is not easy to copy the nature. Yeah, so, solar panels I think that is something that we all are using right. So, this is the, the best way like currently start we should use more and more solar energy this is another recent example of floating solar power plant in China and this is this is another one where uh, this, this, this is a solar panel which which uh, which follow the sun right because that is another uh, drawback of the solar panel that is the sun is the other side your planet is the other side it would not harvest the light. So, this solar panel uh, has that motion uh, sensor which which uh, follow the, uh, the solar uh, sun and have more more energy harvesting right. So, this is the conclusion climate change can be tackled at least can be reduced by by developing a different uh, noble nanomaterials. So, in addition to the, the data that I showed in, in addition to the my research data the other data that I took it from ACS climate change, NASA climate change and this this other site. So, these are really good site if you want to learn more about the climate change and the chemistry behind the climate change you should use these sites. With that I like to thank Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and Department of Atomic Energy for, for, for funding and this is my group Nisha, Kundu Singh, uh, Rustam Singh, Baljit Singh, Mahek Diman, Ayan Mati and Krishna Kant for, for uh, they are my group member. I and Maiti and Krishna Kant are BSc. We generally even hire BSc if they are really good. So, it is the same TIFR exam, same interview, but if you are good, you directly get admission to PhD, right. With that, I like to thank you very much for, for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Paul Shetivar, for a great, amazing lecture and particularly something which uh, I think almost all of us could follow. Yeah. Thank you for that. And we have few time, a uh, few minutes, so we can take up few questions uh, from anyone in the audience. Okay, no questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything you want to ask him about the lecture or even, you know, <laughs> beyond the lecture, you are most welcome. Yeah, oh, I will try. Let me start. Okay, please. Then you'll be induced. Right. One reason I feel is anthropological reason, human activity, and another is geological reason. Yeah. So, uh, do you have any data? How what is the percentage of global warming due to anthropological reason and part of geological reason, which probably we cannot control? Yeah. There is a geological reason also. There so must be a data. I really don't know. There must be a data. But even after yeah. you have the data, we can't control. That's what you said. Yeah, right? so yeah. We, we should so worry about our uh -huh. part. And, uh, no, means what is the major contribution is anthropological reason or major is due to geological reason? Because when the earth was born, certainly this was not the climate at the time of earth or or, or planets born. So thereafter, over the years, earth has got sense of climate change. Yeah. That is not due to anthropological reason. Yeah. That is geological reason. Yeah. So yeah. that is the thing. Some curiosity comes uh, to our mind. I, I showed you one one uh, one data where this is this is the reasoning lots of people give. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one of the reason is the the distance between the sun and the the planet Earth. But and and that's why the amount of energy that you receive from from sun to the but people have reason, people yeah. have monitored that and they said the amount of energy received is mm. nearly the same. But obviously there are other, there are other reasons other that. Reason, yeah. But I I I. I do not know the numbers, but okay. what I can clearly say that whatever you see is because of the human activities and not, not, not the, the other natural processes that is happening. Thank you. Maybe our youngsters can induce, you can ask some questions. Other questions? Okay. Sir, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, you said that your material absorbs uh, 
adsorbs or absorbs? Uh, okay, that's very complicated question. So no. when you say CO2 capture, it has a two chemical processes. One is a phytosorption. Yeah. It just sit on the surface, no, chemi no chemical interaction. Another is chemisorption where um, uh, the amines react with the CO2 and there is some chemical reaction. So CO2 capture is a mixture of two processes. It's a phytosorption plus the chemisorption. And it is because wholly because of the material that you have developed on the surface, like amines. Yeah. So it will absor absorb or adsorb whatever. Yeah. It is yeah. only CO2 and no other gas. Yeah, so it's, it has excellent selectivity over, uh, towards the CO2 or other, other gases. Like, but anyway, the nitrogen and oxygen are less reactive, so they don't really react with the amines. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if at all the uh, industry is giving out some acidic fumes also. Yeah. So that's also possible that it will get adsorbed. Acidic fumes, yeah, it will get Sometimes it will get the absorbed, scrubber yeah. is not but working. Then, then you, yeah, so then you have to have a two material system, right? One material which captures the acidic fume and then you capture the CO2. Yeah. The other issue is the water water vapors in yes. the gas. Yes. And most of these materials may not be stable uh, in water. <laughs> water can break these SI and H bond and then there is no more NH2 on the surface. But then this material is stable towards water vapors also. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I want to extend ma'am's question that sir, CO2 is uh, means like comparatively less harmful than the other ga acidic gases like SO2 or NO2 or something. So in, instead of focusing on CO2, wouldn't it be better if we first try uh, like uh, reducing the NO and nitrogen oxides or the sulfur oxides or all that? Okay, that's a very, very good question. But what, what is the objective? There are two objectives. If you are thinking about the, the, uh, the environmental pollution, not about the global warming, then yes, you, you want to capture the toxic gases. And yeah, here what? Huh? CO2 is like a non-toxic gas. Non-toxic, obviously non-toxic. But uh, I'm not talking about the, the environmental control. I'm talking about the, the decrease in the global warming, where SO2, NO2 contribute really negligible, uh, whereas CO2 contribute uh, very significantly. So obviously, there are groups which make the material to, to take care of the SO2, NO2, and these toxic gases. But here, we really want to reduce the, uh, these uh, greenhouse gases to reduce the, uh, the climate change. Okay, so in at the research level, at the lab level, we tried up to 10, scale, 10 times. If, if, if they are okay with the 10 times, we say, okay, one can do it for more than 10 times. Yeah, so these all of them are stable up to 10 times, up to 10, at least 10 times. That means you can go more, you can recycle. Without any change in the activity? Without any change in the activity, sometimes you have to activate, right? Like, let's say I'm using it for several hours and then these materials can capture some moisture. So you have to heat at 100 degrees Celsius for, for say 30 minutes or something. Yeah, sometimes in some catalysts, it's a very general uh, term. In some catalysts, you don't need; they work for months uh, without without any change in the activity. Uh, some do degrade, right? Depends upon the catalyst. Sir, uh, you told that you will explain the uh, when you uh, showed the CO2 levels in uh, previous years, like uh, 50,000 uh, one lakh years before. Uh -huh. You told you will explain how oh, yes. you found out that. I, I need to use one slide for that. Uh, I somewhere I wrote. I I don't have the site, but I can e explain briefly. Uh, you know about the carbon dating, right? And that by that you can get the age of the of the CO2, and then they drill the uh, the ice core uh, very deep, and uh, based based on the distance of that ice core position from the from the surface uh, they do the carbon dating and from they back calculate the uh, the age of that uh, that that uh, co2 and then quantify the co2 right but if you know more details i think you go to that uh, nasa climate change site where they have a very detailed explanation for how they do it to oxygen yeah. no nothing would happen to because this is si CS2, CS2, NS2. So these are very stable towards the oxygen, even towards the water. If you have SI, NH2, SI, N bond, then these are stable to oxygen, but not to the water. As soon as you put the water, then SI, NH2 becomes SIOH. Right. But when, there are ways to play around and keep the water and oxygen away from these groups. Sir, in that graph that you've shown of CO2 levels in past some uh, one lakh years, 
in that also there was some sudden incre- increase in CO2 and then sudden drop in CO2. Yeah, yeah. So what was the reason at that time of drop of sudden CO2? So that's what uh, you connect with Heath's question. So there are natural processes which changes the uh, CO2 so concentration. That's what he's trying to, to claim. But now you can see uh, those levels were at, at uh, the limit was around 300 ppm. But now suddenly we shoot up to 410 ppm. So obviously that also confirms that it is not only the natural processes but also the artificial things that we are doing now. Thank you. Uh, mine is a sort of lay question. I'm not sure if it's related to your talk. But one of the problems we face in India, maybe in developing countries, is of dust. I mean, particles in the air yeah. of various sizes and various kinds, I suppose. Is there any uh, solution possible using these nano uh, particles or by designing? I mean, is it uh, possible to capture Capturing these? Capturing the dust ah, particles. Dust yeah. particles. Yeah. In fact, that, that really, uh, one should have asked that question about the safety of the nanomaterials, about the toxicity of the nanomaterials. What will happen if these nanomaterials will go into the environment? That's a challenge, ideally. So dust particles are still bigger. Um, so if, if nanoparticles goes in, they will go in your lungs and everywhere. So that is another challenge of use of nanomaterials. Uh, so I don't really have the answer whether we can use the nanomaterials to capture these bigger dust particles. Yeah. But yeah, that's the challenge of, uh, that's really a challenge. Uh, so what we try to do now, can I make a material which is really a big nano, bigger nano size, which will uh, have a less toxicity, less, en- less environmental concern, and still the same activity? So one should not only focus on decreasing the size, but a bigger size, but some of higher surface area. Any other questions? OK. Then I thank uh, Dr. Paul Shaktiwar for really giving a stimulating lecture and also stimulating many questions from our audience. Uh, so we'll take a half an hour tea break. Tea is outside, so I request all of you to join for tea and uh, join back at 11.30 when we start with the validatory function. <laughs>